Hello and welcome to The Thriller Zone. I'm your host, David Temple. Can you believe we're in season six? Season six, who knew? Almost three years ago, two and a half years ago, we started this little podcast, the little podcast that could, called The Thriller Zone. And here we are, nearly three years later, 166 episodes to be exact, as of today. And I could not be more thrilled, more honored to be here, to be your host. What a fun, fantastic time it has been. So here in season six, I am so incredibly stoked to present to you one of the authors that has crossed my radar that I, I, am, I am honored and excited and geeked out to the max, the Mad Max, if you will, to meet him. Today's show is Terry Hayes, The Year of the Locust. When David Brown at Atriac called me up and said, dude, I'm gonna send you a book, a little bit longer than normal, but you're gonna love this. I went, bring it. It is, well, it's good, but it's more than good. And we're gonna talk about it right here in the show. I wanna say at the beginning of the show, once again, thank you for being there. Thank you for supporting this podcast as you have now into season six. A lot of times I'll put this information at the end of the show, but today I'm putting it at the beginning of the show. Subscribe to our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash the thriller zone. All right. Does this good to keep you in touch with us? Subscribers certainly helps the algorithm and uh, it helps me. Also, go to our website, thethrillerzone.com. Easy to remember, right? Do you want to be on the show? Let us know. Simply go to thethrillerzone.com, sign up, and we'll see if we can get you in the queue. I can tell you, February is stacked to the rafters with really, really awesome guests. So get in line and let's get to talking. And now, without any further ado, please welcome Terry Hayes right here on The Thriller Zone. We got 30 minutes, so I'm going to still uh, stay close to that. Good. Are you in Liberace's di- uh, living room? No, no, no. Look, I, no. The, look, these are by an artist called Boric Chipak who is an absolute genius. And I had the very good fortune of recognizing this many years ago. And I bought these candelabra. I love them. I have um, made money on them. And uh, because he's become, yeah, he's not Picasso, but he's become sort of well acknowledged. And yeah. um, so when I moved to Lisbon, I bought some uh, things from the house in Australia, the house in New Zealand that meant something to me. And uh, late at night, late at night, I light them and I wander around the streets of Lisbon with them. <laughs> I love it. And by the way, was not making fun. I love candelabras. It just made me think of uh, our late friend. Uh, yes. And, yeah. Well, first of all, welcome to the Thriller Zone. What an honor to be with you. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you for that. This thing right here, I was—I uh, di- I didn't have time to go to the gym uh, this morning, so I just picked up two copies of uh, Year of the Locust, and I'm doing overhead presses. <laughs> Holy bananas. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, I don't know how to write short. I don't. I wish I did. I, I'd be very wealthy, but um, no, it's got to be epic, I'm afraid. <laughs> Uh, well, first of all, I don't think you should ever worry about that because people, you know, I, I used to, I've always been like that 300, 350 I'm, page count. I'm like, oh, that's perfect. Yeah. And so generally speaking, Mr. Hayes, you would never find me walking around with an epic like this at nearly mm-hmm. 800. However, and we're going to we're going to dive deep on this. This right. is one of the most amazing books I've ever read. Well, thank you very much for that. It's easy for me to say it's one of the most amazing books I've ever written because I've only written two. <laughs> but, um, but thank you. I, I mean, you know, it's a, a nerve-wracking time for me, a very nerve-wracking time. So this is all great to hear. Well, before we start raving, I mean, uh, talking about the Year of the Locust, I'd like to uh, let my listeners know what you've been up to. Now, I have to imagine that uh, you are maybe possibly potentially working on the next and you're not held to anything here because I know there's plenty of people, uh, droves of people going, 
It's been 10 years. When are we going to get another one? So I'm not going to put you in that position. Oh, but, no, uh, go right ahead. It's fine. <laughs> okay. What are you doing? What are you doing next? I'm, I'm doing Pilgrim 2. Um, it, it, I was in the midst of Locust and at a very low ebb, very low emotional, physical <laughs> energy ebb. You know, I was uh-huh. down the bottom of the barrel and um, the publishers realized this and they thought, oh, my God, he's vulnerable. So they called me and said, you know, you could make a fair amount of money out of doing Pilgrim 2. I said, well, I, you know, that, that's not my motivating factor. Right. Except, of course, that uh, Locust had taken a very long time to get to print and I wasn't sure I could ever write anything again. Uh, it was tough. So um, anyway, so I signed on the dotted line and uh, these, you know, they come across very charming people. But very mm-hmm. nice. Oh yeah, but, but they're not. They're not. Don't, don't, don't make that mistake. They um they wrote into the contract that I have very strict delivery dates and quite significant financial penalties if I don't hit them. So not only am I writing it, it's going to be written to a deadline, and it's going to come a lot quicker than Locust did. Now, can I ask you a personal question? Do you, if you have a a, a preference, just a personal preference, someone said to you. Terry, you just take as long as you want. Do you like working in that arena? Or like some people, they kind of like to be pushed into the corner just a wee bit to force them to make sure they're up to snuff and on time. Yeah. You know, I used to be a journalist, uh, right. a, a reporter. So, you know, I, I know about deadline pressure. I also know about the compromises you have to make. But, you know, when I went into this, you know, after the movies and everything, and I'd been fortunate, I'd had some success and we had, you know, a reasonable amount of financial, um, you know, um, sustainability, and that um, it, what uh, I decided what sort of writer I wanted to be. I wanted to be a person who wrote epic stories, you know, after the movies, and that, and that provided, you know, a reasonable amount of financial security because, you know, that they had been successful. Um, I had to decide what sort of writer I wanted to be. Now, Dean Kuntz, an American writer, the Washington Post had a, had a profile of him a couple of months back, and he's written 109 books, which is breathtaking. I, I yeah. mean, it, this is beyond admirable. This is sort of miraculous. Yeah. So, you know, I, I am not disparaging that in any way. That is his business plan. That is his psychology. That is his method. And God bless him for that. On the other hand, J.R.R. Uh-huh. Tolkien wrote two books, The Lord of the Rings Trilogy and The Hobbit. So right. all of us have a decision to make, not just in writing, but in life in general. Where do you want to pitch your tent, you know? Well, I decided to pitch my tent in the epic end of things, and that's so I think Pilgrim was about a quarter of a million words and Locus is about 270,000 words. And they were the books I liked reading, and they were the books that I was going to write. James Clavell, Shogun, Tolstoy, Anna Karenin, a lot of Stephen King's work. Right. And, and so that, that's where I wanted to go. I don't think there's any right or wrong in it. I think that there is just what suits you. So I start on this journey and I give myself a deadline and then it moves. And then yeah. it moves more. And then it moves a lot more. And then it keeps moving because at the end of the day, I had to get it finished. I, yeah. I just had to. And I had the publishers on the phone to me every day or two and saying, look, we can't shift the date yet again. So I knew the deadline pressure at the end. Leading up to that, I was taking my own time because I figure this is going to, these books, and hopefully there'll be quite a number more, are going to outlive me. Yeah. They, I, and my kids are going to read this, yeah, or read my, whatever novels I've written, and know more about their dad than their memories will provide. Mm. Because, you know, I yell at them all the time. I, I'm, <laughs> all, the par- all parents are the same. You don't have time to sit down and, you know, ruminate with them and pass on 
intellectual ideas, if, should you have any? No, you, don't do that. For God's sake, what were you thinking? No, you can't. What have you just spent how much? Yeah. We, we all know that. Yeah. I'll be able to sit down at some time in the future and read this stuff and say, my God, he's not as stupid as we thought. (laughs) And isn't it a shame that they only learn that maybe a little too late? Yeah, but, you know, it's the same for all of us, isn't it? Sure. Yeah, both my parents passed away and, uh, yeah, I look back at it differently to when I was living it. So, you know, I, I think it just goes with the territory. There are so many things I want to talk about, and I want to be really respectful of your time. So I'm going to okay, keep, uh, I'm going to try to move as quickly as I yeah. can. Um, with only two novels to your credit, that in and of itself, that doesn't bother me. I, I don't care. I'm not a, I'm a, not really a numbers guy in one no. sense, because it, it takes what it takes. You're going to do what you're going to do when you get there. Yeah. Now, the fact that you had this rather prolific uh, career as well in screenplay writing. I'd love to drill down mm-hmm. on that for just a minute because I love movies. I love screenwriting. I love the screenwriting process. So, and I know this is a tough question because you just spent a pretty good amount of time telling me your method, but do you have, especially since you, you found screenwriting kind of early and, yeah. and you did very well at it, do you have a favorite between the two or perhaps even better yet, what do you like? more about one over the other. Yeah. Don't be a screenwriter. Never <laughs> ever be a screenwriter. <laughs> Slit your throat. I promise oh, you. Really? Yeah. Well, look, there's a way to be successful in movies, and I didn't understand that until <laughs> it was too late. No, the way to be successful is to be a writer-director, like Oliver Stone, like Chris Nolan like all of that. The directors are the stars. And, and, you know, there has to be somebody in this circus that's, you know, scheduling everything and creating it. Right. And it's the director. And the writer's there to provide something and have to deal with the actors often uh, because director's hiding out in his trailer. Um, and that, So you have a very important function. But the leader of the team is the director. So they are treated with enormous respect. Uh, Writers, in my experience in Hollywood, not in Australia, but in my experience in Hollywood, writers are uh, a necessary evil until AI comes along, in which case they will be an unnecessary evil. Right. Um, So you you don't get much respect. Oh, yeah, they talk to you nicely uh, and stuff. But it's a very, very... um, taxing place to work and it you never actually feel that you, you were the author of this movie that this mm-hmm. movie only exists with you but of course with chris nolan or oliver stone george miller a whole lot of directors yes it is without a doubt their movie because they wrote and directed it so that's the path i would have gone on hey with a novel it's just you Exactly. You. You're, you're on the in the playoff, the third hole of the playoff at Augusta, and you've got a 40 foot putt to sink, and you do it. Yeah. Or well, you miss it. <laughs> if you miss it, everybody goes, oh, he choked. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's They're either going to cheer or clap or scowl. Yeah. yeah. You know, wasn't it Hitchcock that storyboarded? Every frame of his movie and then shot only the storyboard so that Hollywood uh, machine couldn't come in and and alter the cut. Yes, yes. But also he said, uh, very interesting, uh, the, the movie's finished the day pre-production starts. Wow. He, he's, he's not one of these guys. He wasn't one of these guys that thought, well, we'll make it up a lot on, on, the, on the set, you know, we'll improv this. He, he wasn't Robert Altman, you know, who sort of said, right. like, well, let's all hang out together and uh, maybe take some drugs or, and somebody will come up with a good idea. No, it wasn't <laughs> like that at all. Now, you know, he was the author of those movies. They had his signature. Yeah. I can't even name for you, and I know a reasonable amount about movies, I can't even name for you who half the screenwriters were. I mean, 
I, I sit down and watch movies with my kids, some of the Marvel movies, and I look at the credits and, you know, there's a lot of writers involved. And I yeah. say to my kids, I know what it would be like. You'd be sitting in the cinema, in the theatre, with your kids and you'd be saying, wait, 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 that line of dialogue. I wrote that. Now we can go and get popcorn. Well, that wasn't my idea. You know, I, I, oh. I know, for better or for worse, I'll give it my own shot. You know, you mentioned something about Australia, and my wife and I are huge content consumers, and we've noticed a rather large sweep of work coming out of Australia. Is that my imagination, or are you? is that the case? Because there's a lot of it coming out right now. Yeah, yeah. You know, uh, Australia has a uh, has a number of huge advantages, and the primary amongst which is we well, we speak real English, whereas of course nobody else in the world does. <laughs> yeah, but we, but it, it's comprehensible to those in Britain and those in America. So that's a big advantage. Yeah. The Australian New Wave, of which you know I was um, honoured to to be a part of, um, really led to a great array of craft skills. You would be amazed at the number of Australians who've won Oscars for sound design, for cinematography, for costume design. It has a real depth of talent there, which is unusual for a country of 27 million people. The Australian dollar's cheap. We get very good, or Australia, I don't live there anymore, but Australia gets very good, gives very good tax incentives. So you have sort of like a, an ideal scenario to produce stuff for streamers, features, all of that. So you're correct. You and your wife are absolutely correct. Yeah, we're, we're taking over the world. The the gum leaf mafia is is on the move. Well, I've always wanted to visit Australia. It's in my top five places that I want to go, especially Sydney. For some reason, that seem there's a certain magic about that city from everything I read and study. It's just. Yeah. And you're are you from? No, you were born in England, but you spent a lot of time. Well, I'm, I was a migrant kid. I went to Australia when I was five, you know, just with mum, dad, me and my brother. That was it. Nobody else. Uh, we didn't have any grandparents there, aunts, uncles, cousins, nothing. We were just, you know, a little family unit that went there. And uh, I, w we went to Sydney. And in, in Australia at that time, there were only 7 million people. The, the wow. landmass of Australia is the same size as continental United States. So imagine the United States with 7 million people. It was great. Yeah. It was great. You could park at any beach you wanted. There was sure. no chance because there weren't any cars. Um, uh, that, oh, it was fantastic. Now, Sydney is a very large city now with too many people, and a lot of that has been lost. I mean, everybody I knew, and we were not wealthy, we were far from it. I mean, we, we were we were not in good circumstances. But we lived on a quarter-acre block. Everybody else lived on a quarter-acre block, and we played cricket in the street. You know, I mean, I knew people that had horses down the, the back of the back of their garden, and we were 25 minutes from the opera house. So, so it was a magical place to be a kid. We, yeah. we had a creek down the bottom of our garden. My brother found uh, a $1 note floating down it, and for the next six weeks we were all down there trying to find more money. No such luck. It was, <laughs> it was like a bit more like, you know, Huckleberry Finn than, it would be now. Yeah. Before you jump into uh, You're the Locust, I do want to mention something. Uh, uh, I think we've kind of touched on it, but you're really, you, you got up there in the Mad Max world, and I did not realize I was always a huge fan of oh. that epic draw, uh, saga. And what I loved about it was uh, the renegade uh, aspect of it, the, of course, the character building and and I want to ask, I, I, thanks to Wikipedia, I learned that uh, George Miller, the director, when he was considering the sequel, and this is, I'm going to quote this here. He was inspired by Joseph Campbell's The Hero with a Thousand Faces. Yes. And the work of Carl Jung, yeah. plus the films of Akira Kurosawa. And, and, and that was when Miller recruited you uh, to join as the scriptwriter. Now, first of all, let's just, let's just think well, about that. Just, that stop, I'll just stop you there for one second. Yes, please, I'm sir. now going to have to edit Wikipedia. Okay. Oh, as if I haven't got enough work. The, yes, George knew all the movies of Kurosawa. Of course he did. And I'd seen with Jimbo and a few of the others. Um, 
we both knew a fair bit about Carl Jung because we pro- probably both needed to be in therapy. <laughs> I was the one that discovered Joseph Campbell, and I introduced George to that. And it was out of that that we got some understanding, or at least primary understanding, of why Mad Max 1 had worked, and we decided in our wisdom to take everything that we could from Joseph Campbell and turn it into this strange movie, which is basically Shane, the Alan Ladd picture, set in the Australian post-apocalyptic world with a fair bit of Kurosawa chucked in. Go right ahead. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) Well, first of all, get on Wikipedia and edit that thing, would you? I just, (laughs) talking about a trifecta of three different worlds, um, that's what was so influential. Do you think, how many Mad Max, is it uh, five, six? Four, four now. The fifth has come out, yeah. Okay, uh, I, I had heard a whiff of it. Do you think this is one of those movies that will just continue to keep going? And question A, question B is, how will you have any part of that future? Um, I won't have any part of it. Okay. Um, I see myself as a novelist. I always see myself as a storyteller, and I'd always had that ambition to, to write books. I think that um, Mad Max taps into something in the zeitgeist, something deep inside of our consciousness. Uh, I think that Mad Max 2, Road Warriors, certainly did that. I I was the co-author of the script with George on Mad Max Beyond Thunderdome, and I don't think we hit that out of the park as far as we could have. Um, But then he came back with Fury Road, and that's a directorial tour de force. So I think, you know, George is, I guess he must be, you know, close to 80 now. So uh, nobody else could make the movies. So, God willing, he will keep making them, and I think they will continue to find an audience for as long as people are interested in movies Um, because there's something very, very, I don't want to say primal, but there's something that hits a nerve deep inside people. And that post-apocalyptic world, which... Mad Max 1 was not so much part of, but Mad Max 2 was definitely an absolutely conscious decision to do that. Um, That world either appeals or frightens people. So often we go to the movies to be frightened. We often go there because something's appealing. So we sort of got, you know, two out of three ain't bad, I guess. (laughs) Um, This book... um took me uh, a longer than uh, ordinary to read. I know that's a huge surprise. I'm usually about a two day, right. two days I can read a book. Right. This, I think this took me almost two weeks. Uh, just oh ask my, my wife. Oh, no, don't tell the audience that. No, 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 no. <laughs> no before, before you jump on me, here's why. And, and, I, and I mean this in all sincerity. If, you, if you'd ever heard my podcast, and I know this is the first time you've heard it, that's okay. You'll become a fan. Right. Um, this is one of those books, and I can't say this about everything, that as I started, I, you had me at page one, and I said, I'm in for a ride of my life. Mm-hmm. And about a, a fourth of the way in, which was the end of part one, and there's four parts, I said, now, it isn't just a job of mine, if you will, bear yeah. with me on that, but it's a joy of mine, because oh. now I want to take my time with it. Right. And I... And I would find myself stealing away every little few moments out on the balcony in the bedroom down the street at a coffee shop. And it was just one great (laughs) experience after another until I got to about part four. And then I went, this is where I went, what the freak happened? Yeah. And I'm not going to give anything away, Terry, I promise you. But holy bananas, it... uh, at first, you almost lost me, and then I'm like, "No, I'm with you. I'm I'm right. doubling down now." And then I yeah. just—it was the ride of my life for crying thank out loud. You. Thank you, thank you. It was risky. It's and we can't speak in detail about it. No, but it is risky, of course. But to me, it's legitimate because you have a a spy called a denied access area spy called Kane, who mm-hmm. who's who's qualified. To, to captain a nuclear submarine. 
He's been to the, the toughest college in America. He's been to Nuke School. Yeah. And he's graduated, not at the top, but close enough to the top. And that, so he's a man of science. A man, you know, you don't want me driving a, a, a nuclear submarine <laughs> because, you know, I start to think, oh, well, that's interesting over there. Why don't we do this? He's right. a man who, who, who very, very firm views and an understanding of complex things. So you take somebody like that and you project them into a world where that's not going to save you. Right. You try to expose that person to some of the wonders of the universe. And right. just one example of this, he's in Iran, and, you know, his life's on the line. If he gets caught, it's him and four pack ponies trying to save the world in a way. And, that, and he has to rendezvous with a man who's got very important information. He comes to a canyon and he, all of his, you know, mission is about going through that canyon. Yeah. And he, he stops and he gets a terrible feeling and he doesn't know if it's intuition or whatever it is. One of the horses doesn't want to go forward either. And he stands there and he listens. And the only way he can describe this is that he heard gunfire from the future. Now, what the hell was that? He says to himself, how can you hear gunfire from the future? Now he's got a real crisis on his hands. Does he do what a, a guy qualified in submarines in an earlier career would do, or does he listen to his intuition? And he keeps listening, and he knows they're in there waiting for him. He knows he's a dead man walking, and he knows that if he was on the other side, that's exactly where he would ambush somebody. And he knows they're going to shoot the horses first because without horses, without water, without supplies, even if he escapes, he's dead anyway in that environment. So he doesn't go through the canyon. He saves his life. He learns later they were waiting for him. Much later in the book, he sees a vision of New York City in terrible ruins. A, a catastrophic event has happened. And he's sitting talking to his wife and he's trying to describe it to her. And it's very difficult for him to talk about these things because it's, you know, like go and get therapy or be locked up in a mental home. So he's trying to explain it to her. And he says, I see death all around me, all around me. And, of course, she knows he's a spy by then and she knows what his work is. And she says, yeah, of course you do. It's your death. And he says, no, not at all. It's yours. Now, you have to say to yourself, how does she end up in the ruins of New York? How can he see this? Ha uh ha, -huh. that's the trick. And you take this man and you force him to look through a fabric in the universe. You force him to see the wonder of this galaxy we live in. This, the one, the, uh, you know, uh, Einstein said, you know, God doesn't play dice with the universe. Right. Doesn't mean that we understand it all. We understand nothing. And that is his journey. He follows his intuition. He ends up in the ruins of New York. And I'm not giving anything away because if I didn't end the story like this, you would all kill me. He <laughs> saves the life of his wife. And he, doing that, he brings something of enormous benefit to the world. He stops a cataclysmic event. So, hey, it was risky. Am I glad I did it? I don't know. I'll tell you in another few months. But I thought it was sort of neat. All right. A couple of things. <clears throat> it's so funny. And my hand to God, I mean this. That scene that you described at the canyon is my favorite scene in the whole book. Mine too. <laughs> Leading up to it, I was like, bum, 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 where's this going? And then when you reveal that he just knew not to go and the things that revolve around that and what we learn later, that is worth the price of admission right there. And that's, I don't know, halfway or so. That's number one. Number two, that way that you did the ending where I said, what the freak part four? Uh, 
does take you, uh, does require you to step outside your mm-hmm. mind for just a moment. But there's two things I want to walk away with. One is one of my, two of my favorite movies ever of recent, and you mentioned the writer director earlier is Inception. Oh, yeah. Of and the other is Interstellar. And yeah. when I read part of the fourth segment, I was reminded of Interstellar. And then it reminds you of what physics etc is all about and bending time yeah and so a it's fascinating to me and b i want to ask you can we can we take 20 seconds and drill down on that what are your thoughts about that and did you have that influence in your mind when you wrote that yes yes i I had the influence in my mind not so much God forbid that I steal from Chris Nolan. No. Oh, and but, I, yeah, I'm just talking about the 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 the, the metaphysics or the yes. physics of t- yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Because you know, you walk out into the Australian outback, and I made some movies out there, and uh, there, there's no ambient light. There's there's no dust in the sky. There's no pollution, and you can you can touch the Milky Way. I swear to God, you can raise your finger and you can touch the Milky Way. A few experiences like that, and you start to realize that we are in an incredible place in in our lives. And that's always influenced me. And I've always been conscious that the wonder is what we don't understand, that we're on this journey uh, and, and gaining knowledge and and trying to comprehend something that is ultimately, I believe, incomprehensible. So, yes, that's very, very much an interest of mine. But as a storyteller, films like Inception, Chris Nolan's work, a lot of stuff on streamers, the way that movies are going is changing the whole nature of narrative storytelling. Most books... Most books are very conservative and they don't take creative leaps, not because their authors are not capable of it, but because they perceive what the public wants. That doesn't operate in movies. I walk in to stuff that my, I've got two teenage boys. I've got two girls who are a couple of years older, but the boys are always watching movies, which I don't think are that good often. And that, but I walk in and I say, what the hell is happening now? They say, well, what do you mean? I say, how did they get from there to there? They say, who cares? We believe that they did. We make that narrative leap. And books don't do that very much. And that is why books are finding it very, very difficult to pick up younger readers because they are working to a different narrative structure to people who grew up with Jane Austen or Wuthering Heights and, and you know, a, a whole tradition, even, you know, F. Scott or, or Hemingway, it's all changed. With my youngest son, who's 16, Red Locust, now, okay, I'm his dad and he, he doesn't hate me too much. Right. He, he, I said to him, what do you think? He says, it's really great, Dad, so we can ignore that part. And, he, and I said, oh, okay, that's really good. What do you mean? He said, well, I'll tell you, he reads a lot and he sees a lot of movies. All my kids do, read and watch movies. So I said, well, what do you mean that it's great? He said, well, most books I read are in black and white. I said, oh, yeah. He said, Locust is in Technicolor. I said, I'll take that any day. I'll take that any day of the week. I was speaking to a 16-year-old and I said, what do you think about the twist in part four? He said, well, so what? He said, yeah, okay, that's what stories do. He said, I just didn't know how you were going to wrap it up. Thank God I did. Yeah. All right, a couple things. I did do a little drilling down. First of all, folks, we're gonna when we go to wrap this show, you're going to find out I can't find a website on this character, so we'll talk about that in a minute. But I did uh, go down the rabbit hole of reviews, and I want to know in a second your opinion on that. But I hit Amazon, there's like 4,300 ratings already and like mostly four star, almost it's four star average. And then I go to over to Goodreads and there's 5,200 ratings and like 620 reviews with an average of like three and a half out of five. And so I'm like, wait, 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 what? And so there's a couple things going on. I'm like, well, 
And I started reading them, uh, Terry, because I had the extra time. Not really. And I was reading away and I heard these people with the bad stars because I like to know why. what's the yeah. negative stars, right? And I, and I know you probably don't care, but I'm going to get to that in a second. And I'm reading some of these and like, well, you lost me here. And that was preposterous. And I stopped and I thought, and I'm yelling at the screen because I'm an idiot like that. And I'm like, what the frick do you think that escapism and reading to read in a whole different world is all about, you clown? Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. That's a little bit of my soapbox in your defense. But so do you ever read your reviews? No. Good. No. I, I read them for Pilgrim. Because I wanted to know. Um, I Sometimes they come to my attention, the kids, and, and, and print and TV, radio reviews, yes, they're sent to me. I don't read them on Amazon or Goodreads anymore. As I mentioned, I've got four kids. Yeah. Um, I'm used to being called a moron uh, by people I actually like. Um, and you don't learn much from people telling you you're a genius. Yeah, people no. Think that you're a moron. Well, right. okay, don't buy the book. Don't read right. the book. I mean, look, honest to God, this is not cancer research. Right. I have not invaded Ukraine. I right. am not fighting in Gaza. I'm right. telling a story. Maybe you like the story. Maybe you don't like the story. I gave it my best shot. I think it needed to be very bold. I did not want to repeat what I'd done in Pilgrim. I have to write Pilgrim 2, and that will be in a much more different narrative style. And so I took a risk. So what? So did Picasso. Yeah. So did the Beatles. You know? I, I mean, so did Elvis. I can think of five million examples in the creative arts of people who did something that did not exist before and we're all thankful that they did. They didn't get it all right. I mean, not every Shakespeare play is good, but there were enough that were good that it all becomes interesting. So the review, um, look, there's a different type of reader on Goodreads. They yeah. feel very proprietorial oh, yeah. to the published work. On Amazon, it's much more people, well, I'm looking for something to read and this has has done the job. It's very, yeah. very different. And I will guarantee this, as the months and years go by, the Goodreads um, ratings will go up and up and up because it will be less those who think that they are experts on narrative storytelling. That's what Goodreads attracts. Amazon does not. So it is what it is, you know. And, and look, if people are arguing about it, yeah, right. Yeah. I want them to argue. You said something earlier, and I think it's one of the best comments you made, and I'm going to expand on a little bit, and that is this. Uh, I This show is now coming up on three years old. I'm 106. You'll be 166 episodes when I hit. Uh, I've got 25 years. Yeah, wow. thank you. Yeah. I mean, I love what I do. I love talking to guys like you. I love reading. I love writing books myself. <clears throat> and but I have found, and I'm, I'm going to piss off some people when I say that. So just go ahead and here comes the email. But it's this. And I said this to my wife over dinner the other night. I'm like, there's a couple things. I've said, Terry has, and I, I mean this in all sincerity, he has rewired something in my brain now. And I said, I'm going to tell you this, Tammy. If I were to quit this show today, the Year of the Locust is the book that I want to be the last book mm -hmm. I read for a show. Wow. Here's why. It is so thoroughly unique, engaging, genre-bending, metaphysically enhancing, mind-altering in some ways, and still profoundly entertaining. I mean, there's Le Carre. I mean, there's all kinds of influences I could take mm -hmm. off on. But it's the fact that it is so outside the boundaries mm -hmm. of what everything and everybody is doing. And I'm yeah. going to say, this is the part that's going to piss people off. People are writing the same story over and over. Are they ever? Are they ever? And I know that's not popular, Terry, and I don't really care. Um, but I'm, I'm, I'm reading the same story, just new names. And when I read this, I'm like, different and yeah. awesome. I, 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 well, thank you very much for that. I, I, you know, I agree with you. The spy thriller genre, it can be pretty dusty. It can be pretty 
wrote. You know, you, uh, frequently you don't have characters, you just have people with jobs, um, and that's a big difference. It's not pushing out there like what we would think of more as high-level literature does. Right. It, you know, and it pushes out there and leaves everybody behind. You, you, you can't follow it half the time. But okay, they try. That they're, they're on a on a wavelength, and they decide to follow it. Well, I, I'm in a different category. I, I, you know, obviously, I write in commercial terms. I, I mean, I write commercial literature uh, or novels. But I love that. I love that. But if I want to engage the reader, I have to engage myself first. And like you, I'm very widely read, really widely read. And I get really bored because I can anticipate, you know, it's a 300-page novel, 50 pages in, I know what's going to happen. Not because I'm so clever, but because I've read it all before. And that is true in movies. Look, Oppenheimer is a, a fairly conventional story told in the most unconventional way. If you take Napoleon, and Ridley Scott's a brilliant director, if you take Napoleon, that's a very conventional story told in a very conventional way. It's brilliantly directed, but narratively, the audience is five miles in front of it. They know what's going to happen. And then Barbie, I had no idea what was going on. I'm not sure I cared that much, but but my kids did. But it was bold. It took you in a de- in a direction, told a story in a way that you never anticipated. Hundred percent. The spy thriller genre does not do that, and that. So my job was to take you on that journey, set it up with things like gunfire from the future and visions of his wife, and that, so that you're not completely unprepared, and then bring you back and say he went out to the outer edges of the universe and our understanding, and he came back with something very valuable, information. Now, will he be able to fulfill his destiny? And there's a guy that never believed in destiny. Look, there's a wonderful story um, uh, uh, told by a a, a shaman from one of the great um, Native American tribes, and I I can't remember who it was, and forgive me for that. But the shaman went on that journey, that mystical journey, and he met the voice of the, the soul of the universe, and he brought it back to his people. And the message was simply this, be not afraid. Mm. Be not afraid of life, existence, of this vast unknowing thing all around us. Cain goes out and undergoes some sort of strange experience. Mm-hmm. And he comes back and he's not afraid. Mm-hmm. He found the courage and the wherewithal and the information that he needs to go into the most dangerous place on earth and kill a man. And he does. Mm-hmm. Mm. One of the few books at 800 pages nearly that I did not want to end. And I read more people shouting the praises of I Am Pilgrim. And please forgive me, I have not read it yet. But now having discovered you, I'm going to have to read it. (laughs) Good. (laughs) Especially now that I know that Pilgrim 2 is on the way. Yes, yes, yes. Now, but Pilgrim... Pilgrim, I think, you know, I have a, a, a lot of distance from it now, and I, I would write a different book if I was writing it today. But I do think it's a good book. I think it's a good book because it treated the reader with great respect. Uh, it, it was done to a reasonable degree of intelligence, uh, uh, and that people often might, you know, people often say to me, well, who really wrote it? Because right. clearly I couldn't have. But, um, and, but more importantly, it treated the characters with great respect. And so you have a very bad man or a person that's trying to do something very bad, recreate the smallpox virus. But he is so well motivated. Yeah. But by the time you get to the end of the book and the confrontation between these two men, it takes 700 pages for them to meet each other. You're not quite sure how you want this to end. Uh, Mentally, you you know that 
we can't have smallpox let loose in the world. Emotionally, it's heartbreaking that the bad guy had to go on the journey he did. And mm. uh, I won't spoil it for you as to why he went on that journey. But so I think it was run to an unusual order for spy thrillers, which had become, well, man walks out of, you know, a house, kicks the dog half to death, gets in his car, picks up his axe, and then goes around, and everybody's saying, oh, that's a bad guy. Well, great. Steven Spielberg says an interesting thing. He says in movies there are no bad people. There are just people with a bad function. Mm. You've got to find the motivation. You've got to find what opened that wound, you know, generally in their childhood or whatever. So that's what I did. I did it in in Locust. I would do it in every book I ever write. I I want to treat my characters with respect. I love that. And and everyone in this book felt respected in some form or fashion. And the thing that has burned a hole in the back of my cortex is, do you think, or, or how close do you think that this book is to reality in a certain particular foreign influences who don't like America. We'll just use that as a nice, easy canopy or umbrella without getting specifics. But there is a certain regime of people who don't like us. And, and there is, there are bad decisions being made with evil at bay that is hanging around us at all time. And I don't think your average bear even really thinks about it. How close do you think all that is? I, I think that, I think it's very very true. I, yeah. I think that um, in the Middle East, in particular, but not just uh, restricted to there, in uh, deprived communities throughout Europe, there's a, a great feeling of um, anger towards America, mm-hmm. and uh, how America is seen. I think is that it's seen as the far enemy that funds a lot of near enemies. And you don't have to look any farther than Saudi Arabia. There yeah. are lots of dissident Saudi people who know that that regime would fall if A, it were not so oppressive, and B, if it didn't have the tacit support of the US government. Now, we're seeing a, a shocking situation in Gaza at the moment, and God knows where the rights or wrongs of that lay. I, I'm not qualified to judge that, but I will tell you one thing. I will promise you absolutely one thing, that in Gaza there are now two to three new generations of terrorists waiting in the wings. And I think anybody, any fair-minded person would say that if you were in hospital with your wife and kids and you got bombed and managed to survive, you might be looking at some extreme measures, whether it's against Israel or against um any country seen as supporting Israel, and that includes Australia, you'd let the genie out of the bottle. I I mean, and this has been going on for generations. I cannot see any solution. I mean, the political scientists tell us all the time, every war ends in negotiations, every war, even the, the Japanese had to when negotiating with the Americans after you know Hiroshima. Right. The problem that we have is nobody's even talking, let alone negotiating. I don't know how you talk to half of these people, not because they're so dumb, but because we don't even know who they are. Right. I mean, Clinton said, you know, oh, was of the view that Osama bin Laden was just this idiot living in a cave with an AK forty seven. Well, nobody took any time to talk to him. There were never going to be any negotiations. They don't want to talk, and half the time we don't even know who to talk to. So I'm very, very pessimistic about this being resolved in my children's lifetimes. Not just Gaza, I'm just saying this position in which America finds itself. and. You, you know, and it's a tragedy. It is really a tragedy because there are so many great things about America. And yeah. you know, I've lived there for a long time. My wife is American. And, you know, I, I come at it not as an American. I don't have any dog in that fight. Right. But I, I am wise enough to know what good there is. <laughs> don't talk to people in certain groups, both in Europe or in the Middle East, about that. No. No. 
So on a positive note, <laughs> I've got a great reading in my hand. Um, I do want to, since we're running out of time, I want to end on something that I tend to wrap every show with. And it's, yeah. I like to speak to authors like yourself. So many writers, aspiring writers listen to the show. And I like to finish with what's your best piece of writing advice. If you could tell someone who wants to make a career out of this. Exercise. Exercise. It's a sedentary job. It is. It's an important job. It can be incredibly rewarding. It's not worth dying for. It really isn't. You've got to get up and move. And, you know, look, I, I get stuck into it at, you know, 8 o'clock in the morning off and don't go to bed till you know, 11 o'clock at night. And it's an unhealthy lifestyle. I don't smoke cigarettes anymore. Although, God knows, there's not a day go by, and it's been 25 years that I wouldn't like a cigarette. I can tell you that. I don't drink alcohol. I only have two cups of coffee a day. You've got to be tuned up. And, yeah. I, I mean, I'm being partly facetious, but it, it's a very engaging, very harrowing thing to go through these experiences with all these characters. You've got to keep yourself alive for god's sake you know and, and that so that on on one level the, the other my other piece of advice would be to read a book by a guy called lajos egri e-g-r-i and it's called the art of creative writing or the art of dramatic writing he wrote two books now i can't remember what's in what but they're dreadful books. He's dead, so I can say this. They are dreadful books. So you, you, everybody can criticize me, except for one thing. He understands that in order to write, either for movies or for novels and that, you need conflict. If you don't have conflict, then you're going nowhere. You're writing a diary. Good on <laughs> You know, that's great. Put all your thoughts down, and they're very wise, I'm sure, and quite brilliant. But have somebody come in and say, that is terrible. Now argue. Have a conflict. You're looking for people that can find an argument in an empty room. That's the type of characters you want. And so without conflict, you cannot move the story ahead. So that, to me, is the core of writing movies. And if you were to look at Locust or Pilgrim, you would be, perhaps you would see that in every chapter, somebody is trying to stop somebody from doing something. And the greatest dramatic event in the world is the World Heavyweight Boxing Championship. Why? It's in a confined space. You have two men in absolute conflict and only one will emerge the winner. The better the contestants are, the better the fight. Do you want to see Muhammad Ali fight Joe Frazier, the thriller in Manila or whatever it was, or do you want to see Muhammad Ali and Sonny Liston or whoever it was take a dive in the second? No. Right. You want to see the great contest. That's what I try to do. I don't so, know if it works, but I try. Exercise and conflict. You bet. That is the key. That is fantastic. And you're, you're so right. You, you, uh, I have a very large chiropractic bill to prove it. When you're, when you're hunched yeah. over a, a keyboard all day and cranking your neck and doing this with your fingers, no, no bueno. No, absolutely. And it's not worth it. No. it, it I mean, I, I swear to God, you know, I've had some success, I, I mean, yeah, both in movies and, and novels, and I'm really grateful for that. Yeah. I want to be alive to see it. I don't want to be <laughs> gasping on the floor having had a heart attack prematurely, you know. So get up and move around, please. Yeah. Well, Terry, where can people learn more about you? I've done a pretty fair amount of digging down. Of course, most of my information came from my good friend David Brown up at the uh, director of publicity at uh, uh, mm -hmm. Atria Books and Emily Besser Books. But uh, no website, and you don't do social media, do you? No. No? No. no. So wh where can I go besides Wikipedia? You can read my novels. <laughs> you, you, you can read my novels. That's my heart and soul. Gotcha. My, my, my problem is that I, I, I'm a perfectionist by nature, 
And if I was on X or Twitter as it used to be, and I had 140 characters, I'd be commenting on the 2016 election probably tomorrow. It would have taken me eight years to craft 140 characters into something that I thought was worthy of it. So if you have a, a website or a blog, it, it, you, it, my duty is to make it really good. Right. But I don't have the time. Right. And, and, that, and also, you know, I'm not important. There's a great saying, you know, there's two kinds of people in the world. There are those who want to be famous. And there are those who want their work to be famous. I would like my work to be famous. I have no, I've spent more time with Tom Cruise, Mel Gibson, lots of movie stars who, who you know, whose friendship and relationships I cherish. I wouldn't want that world, that life for anything on earth and nothing. I lead a very private life. I have a wonderful life with my wife and kids. We are gypsies. We we move cities, countries every couple of years. But that's my life. I and love it. My public life is talking to you and doing interviews and, and doing many, many other things and writing novels that people, I hope, will say, you know, he's a pretty good man. His values are pretty good. I'm sure there are people who say, yeah, his values are pretty good, but he's really dumb. Okay, <laughs> that's great. But that's my life with my family. I, I have to be very protective of my children. Um, and, you know, I write about terrorism and uh, that's, you know, can be, a, you know, you've got to keep the pin in that grenade. Yes. So, uh, so I try to lead a very normal life. When we first found out my wife was pregnant, we, we had children much later in my life. My wife is American. I met her on the Paramount lot, and we were in Paris, Christmas Eve, and we found out she was pregnant. Wow. And we were shocked. We never thought we would ever have children. We'd been told we wouldn't have children, and without any medical intervention, she was pregnant. Wow. Well, it was a shocking moment. So we're walking down the Champs-Élysées. We head off, and we end up at the Eiffel Tower, and I said to her, well, what are we going to do? Where are we going to live? We're in Paris to look for an apartment to live because we could live anywhere. I was just a writer, you know. And that, so she said, well, I'll tell you one thing. I will promise you one thing. I said, what's that? She said, we are not bringing our children up in Los Angeles. I said, yeah. And she said, no, you're in the movie business. They're going to have a normal upbringing. They are not going to get worried about whether some famous movie star's son or daughter is not being nice to them or yeah. can we go to this party or dad was on the red carpet. No. And she was right. And we never did. We bought, him up, in, we bought him up in Switzerland, firstly, and then Australia. Where I, Well, not Australia so much, but in Switzerland, I lived in complete anonymity. And wow. that is a very valuable thing. Very valuable, and a lot of people don't understand that. And uh, but I'd seen both sides of the coin. You know, I'd been in the movies. I'd been chased across Green Park in London with Mel Gibson at the very top of his fame. I played pool with Tom Cruise and Nicole down on a bar on the Lower East Side, and then I had to call the cops because there was no way that these three thousand people out the front of the bar were going to move. It's crazy time. Yeah, it is, I've isn't it? all that. And yeah. I was never going to be like that, but I didn't want my kids to be. I wanted them to grow to their own light, yeah. and they did. Superb. Well, as I told my wife the other day, I said, I, I'm so honored to be able to. I said, if I didn't have this podcast, I probably would never have the chance to meet you. Our, our paths would probably never cross. So I'm, I'm honored to have had this time, not only because, I mean, you. I'm just, I'm honored to, to meet you and to read this book and to, uh, you're just a wonderful human being and so, oh, so no. talented. But thank you. Thank, and thank you for the time, for the, obviously for the praise, as I say, it's a nerve wracking time. Um, and thank you for making it so interesting. And we oh. managed to avoid the, did you ever date Nicole Kidman? <laughs> do, do you think Mel Gibson has psychological issues? We've managed not to go near that, which yeah. I am 
deeply grateful for because there's many far more interesting things to talk about. And you touched on on so many of them. So it's been an enormous pleasure. And I, I'm happy to do it anytime. You 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 know how to contact me. You won't contact me through Facebook or Instagram or and I'm not doing stupid videos on TikTok. Um, but I'm always here. It's been an absolute delight and thank you so much. Thank you, Terry. Thanks once again to Terry Hayes, author of The Year of the Locust. What a fantastic time. Probably one of my favorite episodes of this entire podcast. 166 episodes, nearly three years. Welcome to season six. All right. How about next week's show? Now, I have not completely verified exactly who's going to be on. Can I just tell you that straight up? It's going to be one of three people. All right because we're having some scheduling challenges. It's either gonna be James Grady. Do you remember the movie, Three Days of the Gondor? Yeah, he's up for the show. How about Greg Hurwitz? Oh, yeah, you know Greg. CJ Box? How in the world have I never had CJ Box on the show? But oh yeah, he's coming. So um, it's a coin toss. We're going to find out. You and I will find out at the same time who's next. So until we speak again, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash The Thriller Zone. Of course, go to our website, thethrillerzone.com. Sign up for our newsletter, whatever you'd like to do. And always, here's the thing. You can always listen to us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher. Well, I think Stitcher's gone. Google's going away. <laughs> It's a tough business out there. iHeartRadio, Amazon Music, wherever you get your podcast, you can catch The Thriller Zone. I'm your host, David Temple. I'll see you next time for another edition of The Thriller Zone.